have on the pole than Winston Cup regular, the only man to ever capture three straight Daytona 500 poles, Kenny Schrader. Brock's with him. Well, Steve, on to Paul. Uh, Kenny, what about this racetrack? Now, we run a lot. We got a lot of rubber down. Is that going to affect uh, tire wear or the way you run this race? You still got to be careful about tires? Well, uh, the old track will just get pretty slick, you know. Won't really probably be a little less on tire wear because you'll be not adhering to the track as much because of the oil and stuff down. But uh, uh -huh. this 40 laps, you don't have time to do much but just go fast right from the start. Can you can you get running too hard in the opening laps and uh, and and then and fry one and, uh, and because you don't have a chance to stop or can you pre is this compound hard enough so you can pretty well run hard the whole 40 laps? We went with a compound that we felt safe on for 40 laps, you know, and uh, you just uh, you want to run as hard as you got to, you know, if you're if you're not leading, if you are leading, you want to run just hard enough to stay ahead of them. If you're not leading, you got to run just hard enough to pass them. Nice to know that you don't have to, if you got the compound, you don't have to worry about uh, frying that right rear, right? Well, we wanted something we could lean on if we had to. Okay, go get him. Thank you. Kenny Schrader. Paul? Well, Brock, starting in the second position is the Chevy Lumina, number 11. John Dillon out of Boise, Idaho. And you got some pretty fast company over there to your left when you get going. <laughs> yeah, Kenny Schrader, you know, he's one of the best. What do you have to do to win this thing here? Uh, f you know, 40 laps on this track is still a fair amount of you know, fair long way, and so consistency is going to be real important. Kenny's going to run real fast, but we hope, you know, the setup stays with us in the end. Sun's burning down pretty good on the car right now. What will that do to the setup, especially the tires? Uh, it tends to grease things up a little bit. You know, we hopefully have adjusted for that, but uh, time will tell. You don't know until the green flag drops. John Dillon, set to go, Brock. Well, Paul, starting third on the grid uh, from Silmar, California, a real regular in stock cars on the West Coast, uh, Jim Thurkettle. And Jim, uh, you have uh, run on the big mile here at Phoenix for a bunch of years. Yeah, we've done pretty well here. We started in the late 70s and uh, got a string of victories going in the 80s. And, you know, we've had some time on this track. Uh, this first time out for this car? No, actually, this is a relatively old car. It's about four years old now. And... Uh, it's uh, probably time for an uh, update. <laughs> <laughs> this race is uh, is a full sprint deal, but you got to watch your tires. I would imagine a little hot out there, and uh, the right rear start going away on you if you don't be careful. Yeah, this track is really tough on tires. You're, you're in turn three and four for a long time. You're just riding the right rear, and if you don't keep your tires under you, you're, you're going to go backwards. <laughs> a lot of discipline required, Danny. You don't want to get too hairy and too eager at the start, huh? Yeah, even in a 40-lap race, it's a matter of conserving your tires to a, to a degree. Okay. All the best. Good luck. Okay, Jim. Paul? Well, just as we suggested at the starting of the show, the name is now on the car, though it's somewhat temporary looking, and Junior Hanley has to start back in 11th position. You got a lot of fast guys in front of you. Are you going to be able to sort this car out during the run? Well, I hope so. We just a little brake problem, and uh, to get the brakes worked out, we just hope we can get up a ways in the front. I don't think we can win, but just try to get to the front. There he is, Junior Hanley, the defending champion here, but now fighting an uphill battle. I'll tell you what, Steve, we've seen that rascal from outside Toronto come down and pick the pockets of a lot of guys all over the United States. But Junior says, I don't know whether I'd get up among the leaders. I would be very, very uh, skeptical about that. Junior was lying through his teeth, and he said, I don't think we could win. Junior has never felt that way in his life in any kind of race car. He was just fun in us. He really was. He is something else, Junior and Hanley. So we'll be watching as uh, this field of uh, stock cars, uh, small block Chevrolets for the most part, gets underway. Uh, they're quick, over 130 miles an hour around this big Phoenix mile, so we're going to see some spectacular running. And unlike the Midgets, where you've got to kind of race a little bit of arm's length as far as getting your tires together and uh, spinning each other out or flipping over the walls, I got a bet we'll see a different tack from this stock car driver. We'll have to see a little wall bang and a little paint swapping. Oh, yeah. Bender. These guys will lean on each other uh, without hesitation. Most of them out of California and uh, in the West Coast, uh, short track circuits and the experts uh, on the shorter tracks, but I'd like to Jim Thurkettle and come down and run this big mile every once in a while and do very well. And I don't think they're intimidated at all by Ken Schrader. Ken Schrader spends over 200 days a year buckle into a race car of some type. He is unbelievable. He can run not only these things, he runs the big Winston Cup cars, as George Snyder does, uh, a great veteran of Indianapolis who's starting in this field. Uh, uh, Schrader also is an expert in the open wheel cars. He'll run a sprinter, he'll run a championship dirt car. 
He'll climb in at just about anything. And there's poor old underdog Junior Hanley sitting back there in row six. Got to shed a tear for him. Ron Esau, we saw him win a race uh, on our very show at Riverside a That's few years right. ago. Strong runner out of Southern California. Excellent driver. Uh, has uh, done very well in this kind of race car. Uh, a lot of people uh, look to him uh, to do very well here today. Now, open wheel drivers will tell you that if that's your goal, don't start in stock cars because you learn bad habits like leaning on each other. Uh, you see Kenny Schrader, he came from open wheel into Winston Cup in stock cars. You don't see him go the other way very often. No, it's a little difficult. But then again, uh, young Jeff Gordon has his eyes uh, set on uh, Winston Cup racing. Uh, a lot of guys are starting to move back and forth now. It's uh, fortunate that they're able to do that. You know, short track stock cars don't vary a whole lot from coast to coast, but each racetrack has its own special set of rules. Steve Evans earlier had a look at the kind of cars that run here at Phoenix. The midgets we have seen today, well, they operate under the rules and regulations of the United States Auto Club. The stock cars we're about to see, well, they're part of NASCAR's Southwest Tour and operate under those rules. Now you think, NASCAR, steel race cars, uh-uh, big exception here. These are all fiberglass cars, identical in almost every way to machines we have shown you in the past, from the ASA in the Midwest and All Pro down south and the American Canadian Tour cars. In fact, the O2 car here of Larry Barton is from British Columbia, Canada. Now, the few exceptions, though, are very important ones. For one, they do not allow any kind of a weight break for a V6 engine, so nobody runs one. These are all V8s, about 355 cubic inches. They do, however, offer a 150-pound weight break if you run 9-to-1 compression. Everybody does. Even a 12-and-a-half-to-1 motor wouldn't make up for that 150 pounds. Very important exception is under the air cleaner here. Not the little 390 carburetor as required in other associations. It's a big 750 carburetor. Costs about $1,000, but everybody opts to run one here to try to be competitive. They do not have to run on a spec tire. They can pick the stickiest tire they want on any corner of the automobile. So all in all, they're going to be a bit quicker, a bit faster, and a lot of fun to watch on the world's fastest mile racetrack. And are they quick at Phoenix? Well, let me tell you about Jim Thurkettle. Back in 1987, he qualified his car at 137.2 miles an hour. Kenny's on the pole today at 132. A little bit of a different rule setup, but at the same time, they come off turn number four. We've got a green flag. And it is Kenny Schrader, the red 74 car, leading him down into turn one with John Dillon, number 11, right alongside him on the outside. But the butt car is about a car length in front. All right, uh, this front mob of automobiles down into that tricky dog leg on the back side of the racetrack. Schrader leading him. Dylan Corelli and Thurkettle in the top four as they come down through turn number four. Corelli goes low in the six car. He gets underneath Dylan and will take second place as they sweep down the front straightaway. That was a very nice move by Rick Corelli. And here in the early going, everybody's got a lot of tire. And they can try some things they might not be able to try later on in this race safely. No question. As uh, Kenny Schrader and the 74 moves out to about a five-car length lead over Rick Torelli. As that big sweeper that forms turns three and four here will be the place where they're going to use up some rubber, as Jim Burkettle said earlier. Well, Kenny Schrader, he's just driving that car, I think, as hard as he possibly can. Except maybe in that turn three, turn four area. Uh, as Dirk Kittle said, you spend a lot of time there, but I don't know if you drive it any harder. <laughs> well, uh, Kenny Schrader has uh, established himself as the, the man to beat right off the bat. As Rick Corelli moves, oh, trouble in turn number two. That is car number three, Harry Brady. He got into the wall, apparently not too hard, and uh, has got the motor running, and apparently he's going to get out of harm's way, but still, the yellow flag will be out for a while. We'll take this break. Stay with us from Phoenix, Arizona. Stock cars of the Skull Bandit Copper World Classic are still under caution. You know, I personally have not visited Phoenix International Raceway in a number of years, and quite frankly, I can't believe my eyes. So let's go to Brock Yates with a man who is responsible for one of America's finest and busiest racetracks. Steve, I'm with Buddy Jove, who owns this magnificent facility, and uh, I'll tell you what, Buddy, I... I'm just delighted to be here. I've been back to Phoenix in about uh, four years, and you guys just won't quit making this racetrack so good. Well, Brock, we're happy you're here, and uh, I tell you what, it's, it's, a, it's a great w weekend for racing, and uh, uh, race fans and our television fans are really going to see a super, super show. This event has become increasingly important every year. It just and now it's become, it's a classic. There's no question about it. 
Well, you know, most of our, uh, our drivers and car owners consider this their Daytona or the Indy 500 for them. So there's a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of desire to win this race. So it's 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 really uh, every year it becomes a greater stature. Well, we're going to go racing. Thanks for having us, buddy. We'll see you shortly. Thank you. OK, Steve. Absolutely, we are going to go racing. Pace car off the track, the green flag is out, and Kenny Schrader continues to lead here in Phoenix. The 74 car out front, but boy, he has got some competition. Right behind him, the six car of Rick Corelli. Corelli got a great restart, and he is right on the rear bumper of Kenny Schrader as they come off turn number two. He'll try him on the outside a little bit. He took a peek through the dog leg, but that won't work. Schrader is too uh, savvy a veteran to let anybody by on the outside in a fast corner as they uh, come down off turn number three and through turn number four, that big sweeper onto the front straightaway. Corelli stays right with him. Right behind him is John Dillon, the 11, and then Jim Thurkettle right behind him. So the top four all running together. And the 14 car, that is George Snyder out of Bakersfield, California, who has driven every conceivable kind of race car. He is battling with uh, 92 Conrad Morgan right now, the blue car for that fourth spot. Well, A.J. Foyt, of course, is very close friends with George. George has been the backup driver for years at the Speedway for uh, uh, A.J. And the 14 number, of course, is famous in uh, Foyt stable as well. As we watch uh, Kenny Schrader continue to lead it here, but uh, Rick Corelli stayed right on his tail. He's fallen back a little bit. Maybe Schrader responded to that challenge Corelli gave him uh, in the uh, restart. Let's check out our old pal Junior Hanley. He's in that borrowed Corelli car, the 6X machine, and he is in ninth position in front of him. Randy Olson in front of Olson is Lauren Kelly in the 20 car. So as Junior comes, stays nice and low, coming off turn number four, he is going to get underneath Randy Olson in the 17 to move up into eighth place. At least apparently so. Olson stays high, trying to run with him, but I, Junior finally takes over that position as they come through turn two and out onto the dog leg. Well, Brock, Junior's success here may depend on the number of incidents, the number of caution flags that will tighten up the field. Well, look at this, Steve. Corelli moved right up on uh, Kenny Schrader as they come down the front straightaway. Corelli uh, fell back a little bit there and now is really challenging. Put some big time pressure. Oh, Kenny got real loose between turns one and two and almost stuffed it in the fence. In fact, got high enough so that Corelli has stuck his nose underneath and will take the lead through the dog leg. So that bobble cost the lead for Kenny Schrader. And if I know Schrader, it made him mad and a little bit embarrassed. Watch this. <laughs> He's coming, Corelli. <laughs> That's right. Although Rex pulled out a good lead now. That was a costly bobble for Schrader. As they sweep down into turn number one, uh, it looks like Schrader's coming back on the attack off the back straightaway, and he blows right past Corelli through the dog. So uh, you're right. Schrader did respond instantaneously. I tell you, Brock, the way Schrader blew by Corelli, it was like he had an afterburner on that car. I mean, that was impressive. Yeah, it implies that he was taking it easy uh, prior to that, that uh, he was just running uh, strong enough to stay in front of Corelli, and he uh, responded with uh, some real verb. Here is Junior Hanley moving underneath uh, Lauren Kelly in the black 20, trying to take over seventh position. Let's see if Junior can make it work. There they're working their way down the back straightaway into the dog leg. Junior's got the good line there. That's the fastest part of the racetrack, probably about 160 miles an hour. And down into turn number three, Junior has got the good line. He, oh, look at that. Kelly got way wide. Junior just sweeped past him. He's moved up into seventh place. Well, it's for sure Corelli loaned Junior a first-rate automobile. He is oh. picking his way through this field beautifully. Oh, absolutely. There's the other team car, the other Corelli team car. Falling back a little bit, and Schrader suddenly establishes major domination here. Well, our leader has got a whole bunch of lap traffic to get around. There's the number 95 car, Steve Barry. He blows right by him. Up front now is 05, Tim Franklin. Smokes him. 58, David Schuyler. Everybody getting a look at the leader, Ken Trader, as he gets through lap traffic very cleanly and is now broken away from the number six car of Rick Corelli. We'll be right back to Phoenix. Stay with us. This is a barn burner. Phoenix Mile for more.
more Copper World Classic action in that 14 automobile, Baker's people's own George Snyder, Indianapolis veteran. He's in a battle for fourth place with the 92 car, Conrad Morgan, 28 Gary Collins, and 6X. You know him, Junior Hanley. Yep, Junior Hanley, the old snowbird racer from the province of Ontario, is really smoking here. He is on the inside trying to challenge the 28 car, Gary Collins, for the sixth position. In the meantime, the 92 car, Conrad Morgan out of Heartland, Wisconsin, way up north, goes on the high side to try to get around 14 George Snyder to take over that fourth position. So Morgan makes it work and uh, does it the hard way, getting around a real veteran, uh, the long way around this big Phoenix mile. Well, Junior Hanley has found a quick way around it, and that's on the inside. He is inside Gary Collins now and just about to stick a fender in there to secure that six spot. He's got it. And here he comes up on George Snyder, staying low, and he'll move past George Snyder as uh, Junior Hanley continues to move. He's now sitting in fifth position. And Junior is walking a bit of a tightrope, really. He's got to drive very aggressively, yet somehow he's got to try to preserve his tires. Everybody talked about that before the race, Doug. Back to the leaders. Kenny Schrader now uh, giving up a little bit of distance to uh, Rick Torelli, who has moved back into at least reasonable contention. Remember, a few laps ago, uh, Kenny had moved out to maybe uh, almost a half a straightaway lead, but Torelli's come back. Now, that could be simply uh, Kenny trying to preserve his tires and back it off a little bit, but you can be sure that Schrader's not going to get all uh, wobbly in turns one and two like he did before. He's definitely been more attention to keeping it on the racetrack. That was the uh, front of three of Harry Brady that the uh, leaders just put a lap on. Pirelli uh, is trying to mount a serious challenge here, but every time he gets up to where uh, he fills up the rear view mirror, it looks like Schrader just stands on the gas a bit harder. Those automobiles, by the way, even though it's a little hard to tell, are both uh, Camaro body cars. They're pretty much standard issue uh, for this kind of competition. Most of the field like that. But uh, Schrader, of course, with all that experience in setting up race cars like this, uh, has the handle on it, and uh, he is running well. Although, I'll tell you what, Rick Corelli's doing a fine job of staying with him. And our viewers might remember Rick Corelli from our coverage of the All-American 400 in Nashville, Tennessee last year. He was a guy with the incredible trailer, big 18-wheeler that holds not only the stock car, but dirt cars. His sponsor, a Chevrolet dealer in Colorado, loves to race anything with wheels on it. Well, he's got to be proud of what uh, Rick's doing and also uh, what his old uh, substitute teammates doing back there in the 6X. Uh, junior uh, Hanley has moved into the fifth position. All right, look at Corelli now, Steve. He's within a car length. He's moving in on Schrader as they get down into turn number four. Look at this. Corelli is going to challenge for the lead down the front straightaway. Absolutely, and I don't think Schrader can hold him up. He has got the favored line here. He outbreaks Schrader into that turn, and Corelli is now your leader. And that was not a case of Schrader saying, you lead for a while, buddy. I'll follow you. Oh, he no. lost the lead to an aggressive young man. Excellent piece of driving on the part of Rick Corelli, who now has pulled out about uh, four car lengths on Schrader. So whether Schrader's losing some rubber back there, starting to hurt a little bit in the handling department, hard to say, but definitely Rick Corelli has established a real stout lead here at Phoenix. You know, the racetrack itself, the layout of this track is just conducive to good racing. Now he's got a pair of twins in front of him, the team cars of Phil Perry and Tommy Price, the 22 and 83 cars. Uh, he's going to split right between them. Good work uh, uh, weaving his way through some slower traffic there. Kenny Schrader stays right with him. So uh, I don't think we've heard the last of Schrader, but definitely a player comes uh, into the game here with Rick Corelli in that uh, pretty kind of wild pink automobile in six car leagues. I believe Corelli now has the better handling automobile, Brock. It just appears to be more stable everywhere in the racetrack than Schrader's car. Schrader is really having to fight it. Yeah, he's working hard uh, to hang in there with. Uh, it's going to be a question of setup, chassis setup, and how everybody's tires hang together in the later stages. Down to who? Oh, Corelli had to get out of the throttle. He bobbled in turn number three, and you can see that he just about stuffed it in the fence there. Also, there was a fire out of the exhaust pipe, but uh, these are not turbo-powered cars where you uh, expect that sort of thing. These are normally aspirated gasoline motors. I don't know what all that was. Well, that big carburetor, I'm sure, when he had to get out of the power to uh, get the car gathered up again, uh, just uh, gave a big burp of fuel out that exhaust pipe. But uh, you're absolutely right. It looks like a turbo car. He's doing it again. 
head here through turn three and four. And Hunt's just be running real rich like you say when he gets out of the throttle on a lot of unturned fuel gets in the exhaust system. Doesn't appear to be dropping the cylinder. It sounds fun. But they are slowing down. We've got a yellow. Yeah, we have got a yellow for real good reason. There is one monster problem up in turns three and four. Uh, the 83 car at Tommy Price, the 80 car up against the wall, Ray Daniels, Harry Brady in this thing, the three car. And one of the front runners, Jim Thurkettle, the number four car in this deal. He started in the third position. Funny Lauren Kelly, that was a black car we just saw pulling away. In fact, this accident is so bad, they have put out the red flag. Brock, they're gonna stop it until they clean it up. Well, the good news is, Steve, that nobody was injured in uh, that melee over there. So fortunately, it's just bent metal and, uh, and shattered fiberglass. But it is going to take some time to get everything cleaned up. These fiberglass-style race cars are far cheaper to repair uh, than a similar bent-up metal car. You just snap on a new body panel. But when they crash, you get it all over the racetrack. Right now, let's go to Paul Page. Steve, as they roll to a stop here at the front of the row under the red flag, here's Rick Corelli. You're in a whale of a fight with the man right behind you. Yeah, Kenny's running real good. You know, it's a brand new car from A1 Engineering and a new Fisher motor. And we come here thinking we knew what we had. We finally figured it out today. The car was tight all weekend. And we made some adjustments last night, and it's running good. You going to be able to hold him off? I think so. I think we got a little more corner speed than Kenny, but we just have to watch out with this oil all over this racetrack. Track's getting a little snotty right now, but the car feels real decent. It's starting to come to me better. How about the sun? The sun won't be a factor, I don't think. Later on in the year, the sun gets down a little lower, and it seems to bother us. But right now, we're all taped up, and we're geared for whatever it takes the rest of the way. All right, Rick Corelli has pulled up in the number one position. In the meantime, we move back to the second car on this stop field. And of course, that is none other than Kenny Schrader. And as they bend down and have a little bit of a conversation with him, we'll try to move in here. Mike Devon, the United States Auto Club, just giving Kenny some instruction. You're in a pretty pitch battle here, Kenny. Well, uh, he's working just a little bit better than we are, but they all this whole track down now, so it'll be it'll be fun the rest of this race. Is it slicking it up pretty bad? Well, yeah, it's, it's getting pretty slick, and we got our little car a little bit too loose, so uh, we're, we're sliding plenty right now. All right, so Kenny Schrader, that green flag comes out again. You're going to see a wonderful fight at the front of this field. Well, just what they needed, Brock, uh, an incident that might have put a little more oil down. In fact, there you see the speedy drive going down to try to soak it up. Probably a pretty intelligent decision to red flag this thing, considering that. Huh? Uh, Steve, that's probably the biggest uh, casualty of this race. That's the number four uh, Camaro of Jim Thurkettle, who was running with the leader, started third, and uh, now out of the race. And now, let's go back to Paul. Well, working his way up, slowly but surely, Junior Hanley. You got brakes on this thing? I got brakes now. I just got brakes about five laps ago, so I could get stopped. The car's working pretty good, but I don't know if I can catch those guys or not. You think you have any chance at all of getting up in that fight? I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> this red flag's going to help. Yeah, I know. We just have to try. All right, so Junior Hanley, still in this battle, no question about it. Steve? Yeah, that poor underdog, Junior Hanley. <laughs> poor mouth of this again. All right, well, there's the 92 car. Conrad Morgan getting a little attention. Stay with us. We'll be back. Well, that crash chewed up Jim Thurkettle's Camaro so badly they had to bring out a flatbed to get it off the racetrack. Uh, a major casualty. Poor Jim was running up in third place when he got tangled up in that mess. Just a few moments ago, uh, Paul Page caught up with Jim in a pit area to find out his version of what happened. Jim, you had a great run going, running in third. The leaders were pulling a bit, but uh, then suddenly all all hell broke loose. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> I, apparently, one of the lap cars that was in between uh, Corelli and myself uh, started spraying water or oil. Or I just went into turn three. Uh, a normal lap, and it just started swapping in. So there, there was like ice skating, and I backed it into the wall, and then got T-boned, and and uh, just came to a grinding halt right there. Well, that you're standing here tells us you're okay. What about the car? Oh, I don't think it's too good. I uh, I, I imagine uh, at least a couple corners are bent up on the thing. But you didn't get all four. No, I think I think the left side's okay. <laughs> get back out there. <laughs> I, I would if I could. We're sorry it happened to you. Thank you. Well, you know, he told us earlier that car was four years old and needed replacing. Well, now he doesn't have any choice. <laughs> All right, they're forming up. Corelli will be up front, followed by Schrader, Randy Olson, Jr. Hanley in that four spot in the borrowed Corelli car, followed by Ron Esau. Then we on 
Crafton, Barton Perry, and John Pax. Well, we've got Esau and uh, Junior Hanley, both a couple of veterans and a couple of fine race drivers, who's starting to poke their way up toward the front. But at this particular moment, with the green flag about to fly, we've got Rick Corelli leading him down off turn number four. And Schrader wasting no time. He immediately goes to the outside, going to try to beat him into turn number one. Two cars wide here through turns number one and two. Schrader will not give way as they come off turn number two. Schrader hangs on, but Corelli, better corner speed or exit speed is enough to pull him through uh, the dog leg and reestablish first place. Well, I'll tell you, you talk about intimidating. When Schrader comes up on you like that and just rubs right against you and dares you to try to do something about it. Ooh, that's tough, Curry. Well, Corelli had the good line, and uh, Kenny really couldn't. Uh, he had to take the long way around, but he won't give up side by side through turns one and two again. And the fire out of Corelli's exhaust by licking the side of Schrader's car. Kenny, this time may make it work. He's side by side one more time. Here they come through turn number four. This is going to be a drag race down the front straightaway. Yeah, but look right behind him. Junior Hamley making his presence now. Challenging 17, Randy Olson for third spot. That means Don Olson. And now he's going to try to get inside Trader. Junior Hamley, the Canadian is right up amongst them. Kenny Schrader had to give way, could not make it work. He tried two hard charges on for two consecutive laps to try to get around Corelli on the outside. It would not work. Now they've got him in a sandwich. Oh, and they tangle Schrader, hits Corelli. Corelli does a wonderful job of recovering that car. And Junior Hammond says, go ahead, boys, take each other up. <laughs> Here comes Junior underneath his teammate and car owner, Rick Corelli, challenging for second place. Kenny Schrader's got a little bit of a lead, but both those two pink number sixes, six and six X, right behind him side by side through turns four. Well, obviously, no deals were made when they loaned Junior Hanley that car. That could happen sometime. Hey, if we're racing, you can play. No deals here. So Kenny Schrader's got a pair of angry Camaros right behind him as uh, that terrific move in the middle of turn four on both on the part of Schrader and Corelli saved a big, big tangle. Oh, boy, I thought Corelli had lost it for sure. I mean, Schrader gave him a pretty good shot. That was an interesting race car drive. So it's now Junior Hanley. Corelli could have uh, fried some rubber in that little bobble, and uh, he may be having some problems with handling at this point because uh, he's falling back a little bit. The only challenger right now to Kenny Schrader is Junior Hanley, who uh, hangs in there. There they go through the fastest part of the racetrack, through the dog leg on the back straightaway. Uh, Junior Hanley just taking that same low line that's worked well for Schrader. It really is the quick way around this racetrack, uh, given there's no extra traffic. Well, the cars of Pirelli and Junior Hanley 6 and 6X are owned by Chesron Racing out of Colorado, and I'm sure the Chesron family, your automobile dealers at the Mile High City, are in the great state biting their nails. <laughs> Yeah, this is uh, going to turn out to be a three-ray battle because Kenny Schrader uh, right now is uh, moving a little bit away from uh, Junior Hanley, but there's traffic up ahead, and it ain't going to be easy for Kenny, I'll guarantee you. No, it isn't. And look at Junior back there, just dogging his every track. Uh, Junior's pretty still going to try him, I guarantee you. Well, Junior told Paul that uh, he had some brakes now. I don't know what he meant. Maybe he didn't have any brakes in the beginning, or maybe he just wasn't using them. But Junior is right up on Kenny Schrader now as they come off turn number two and down the back straightaway. A challenge for the lead. And to make things even more difficult, they're driving right into the sun. Junior Hanley now leads the Copper World Classic Stock Car portion. All the way from 11th place, picked his way through this field, patiently just uh, moving around, high side, low side. Junior Hanley now says goodbye to Kenny Schrader. All kinds of power and handling in that number six X. Now, you know, I seldom write, so when I am, I like to look back and reflect upon it. <laughs> I said the yellows and the incidents would have a lot to do with Junior's success, and I think it did. Uh, the incident itself, the red flag, not only tightened up the field, but moved Jun Junior into that fourth position, the third pedal went out. Uh, he is one of the most underrated drivers, at least among the public. The, the racing uh, fraternity knows about Junior Hanley, known about him for years and years and years. Runs his own shop in a suburb of Toronto and has just been very successful all over the United States and in Canada, especially in short track competition. 
been very successful here one year ago when he won this event in his own automobile and now leads it in a borrowed car. Junior Hanley does indeed love Phoenix. Well, here's a guy that won't like it too much. Phil Perry is up against the wall, the 22 in car, and that will bring out the caution flag. Started 20th and now is stationary up against the concrete. Now this caution rock works against Junior Hanley. It sure does, Steve. He uh, has to give up that uh, pretty substantial lead he had over Kenny Schrader. But on the other hand, it gives everybody a chance to cool off their tires. And with a few remaining laps left here in this stock car show in Phoenix, Arizona, stay with us. Back at the stock car portion of the Copper World Classic, we are ready for yet another restart. Junior Hamlet, the 6X car, you know the story by now. He's borrowed it from the Chesron team. Ken Trader in the second spot in the 74 car. Rick Corelli, Chesron's prime driver in the 6 car, who led for so long, is now back in the third spot, followed by Randy Olson and Lauren Kelly running up the top five. But you know, Steve, uh, it really is a three-car race, barring some disaster, uh, some backmarker, uh, spreading uh, uh, debris all over the race track or taking out one of the leaders. But uh, really, it's going to be this man, Junior Hanley in the 6X, right behind him, Kenny Schrader in the red 74, and Rick Corelli in the 6. We're going to do battle here in the closing laps. Just 15 laps remain here at Phoenix. The green is out. And here is Junior Hanley, followed by Ken Schrader and Rick Corelli, the three guards Brock is talking about. Junior got a good start, a good launch as he heads down into turn number one. Schrader now being challenged a bit by Corelli. Corelli trying him on the high side, coming off turn number two. Let's see if that works. We've seen some passes here. Meanwhile, Junior runs free out front. Got himself a good, good lead here. And looks like he's trying to extend it a little bit because Schrader's going to have to handle Corelli here. And I really wonder if Corelli's car has as much power as Junior Hanley's machine. That little fire we see coming out of the pipe, it might be just a little bit too rich, whatever. It doesn't appear to have quite the steam that Junior does. No, Junior is uh, having no problems right now holding off. But uh, uh, Schrader, as a matter of fact, he pulled out a little bit. Pulling uh, Schrader down that uh, through the dog leg. Now, you think that sunshine is bright through our camera and through your television set. Imagine driving into that sun. All of these racers have tape on the windshield to uh, offer a sunshade. So, Junior leads him down into turn number one. There's a little burp of fire out of Junior's car as well. That may be the setup on uh, both those Corelli cars. All right, here's your race for fourth place. That's the 17 car, Randy Olson. A uh, little bit of an interval back to the 20 car, Lauren Kelly, right behind him, the five of Brian Germain as they head down the back straight away. So they're having a good race there for that fifth spot particularly, but uh, as you said, uh, the real runners, Hanley, Schrader, and Corelli are uh, now for doing the set, running harder than anybody else on this racetrack. They've pretty much broken free from the pack, and uh, it doesn't look like uh, Kelly or uh, Olsen are going to have a chance to catch up unless they're trouble. There is trouble in turn number one. That is the 14 car of George Snyder up ahead of him, the 83 of Tommy Price, both sideways and up against the fence, and also involved in the 57 of John Kelly. It looks like the cars are going to get underway, but we've got a caution, Steve. Well, today has been double trouble for Tommy Price. His 83 car has been involved in two incidents so far today. But as you said, this one uh, should not take very long. There's no cleanup necessary, no, very little debris in the racetrack. So the caution is out really just to get the cars uh, out of uh, where they might be a problem on the racetrack. So we're going to see yet another restart, and I'm sure that Kenny Schrader is going to uh, try to get that uh, jump on Junior Hanley, but uh, an old pro like Hanley doesn't pop and get snookered on a restart. Oh, no, you are not going to wrap Junior Hanley, not even a Kenny Schrader three-time Daytona 500 pole winner. You know, Kenny Schrader, he's a real loose guy, too, Rock, as you well know. The first time I met Schrader, it was his first ever Winston Cup road race at Riverside. You remember that? Yep. And he had taken a page out of the program that showed the course layout and taped it to the dashboard. <laughs> He has got a great racing attitude. As you said earlier, he hangs around, uh, he runs races anywhere he can jump into a car, runs short track shows, runs, of course, a big Winston Cup schedule, runs the dirt cars, runs midgets when he gets a chance. He just loves to race, got a great attitude. I asked his wife one time uh, how she handled all of that. She said, hey, whatever makes him happy. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, here's an old man that loves to race, too, Junior Hanley, and he is jumping on the throttle here as they come off turn number four. The green is out. Let's see if Ken Trader will challenge as he did on the last restart. No, sir. J. 
Junior Hanley says, uh-uh. Torelli lets you do that. I'm not going to. <laughs> oh, there's a sweep down into turn number one. Let's see what happens in that race for second spot. Corelli may have a little bit left inside that uh, six car. Through the dog leg, there's your leader, Junior Hanley, breaking free once again. Behind him, Kenny Schrader, and right behind him, Rick Corelli, the only three major players in this race at this particular point. Look at this. Corelli right up behind Schrader. I think he hit him, Brock. I think he moved him out. He did. Final lap, white flag got Corelli underneath Kenny Schrader. So we've got the two Cheserat cars suddenly running one, two. The question is, can Rick Corelli run down the man he loaned the car to? I don't think Jenny's going to let that happen. Well, Corelli's going to have a go at it as they come down into turn number three. Big, wide sweeper, only nine-degree banking here as we watch the final lap unfold in the Conquer World Classic. Headed for the checker, Junior Hanley will win it. For the second year in a row, but this time with far more dramatics and theatrics than we saw here a year ago. Gosh, what a great race. I'll tell you what, these are going to be fun guys to talk to. <laughs> I want to hear what uh, Kenny Schrader has to say about that little move Corelli put him on in turn four on the final lap. So Junior Hanley, Campbellville, Ontario, outside the great city of Toronto, comes home a winner far, far away from home here in Phoenix, Arizona. And Rick Corelli gives Junior a big wave out that side window as he did a nose-to-tail victory lap for the fans, and there's a lot of them here in Phoenix. And they'll long remember the name of Junior Hanley here in the desert as for the second year he has captured the Copper World Classic. Stay with us. We'll be right back to talk to the man from Ontario, Canada. Fun in the sun. That's what everyone had here today at Phoenix International Raceway, the Copper World Classic. A great midget race followed by a sensational stock car race. Junior Hanley in the borrowed 6X car from the Chesron team. Finishes just ahead of his new teammate, Rick Corelli, in the number six car. Kenny Schrader, while well, he banged with Corelli a couple of times, that proved to be pretty interesting. Conrad Morgan, a good afternoon. Lauren Kelly also. Danny Crafton finishing eighth. John Pax ninth. Darren Rogers in the tenth position. And there is Junior Hanley. Paul Page is down there with him. And Steve Junior Hanley climbs out of the car. Ted Lake puts the wreath on him. He's got plenty of dirt on his face. Have you ever been through a race like this one? Well, we used to race on the dirt a long time ago. <laughs> and we had a lot of cautions. And uh, I thought Schrader, he was back and back on the restarts, and I thought he was going to get me. But this motor really run good. I got to thank Fisher. I got to thank the guy that owns this car and uh, just everybody that helped me. And, uh, the map guy, all of those guys. When when they pulled your car out and said it's not running, did you give any chance at all you'd be standing here right now? Well, Rick told me I could use this car, but every time I ever used anybody's car, I always crash him. So I said I didn't really want to use the car. And then his boss come and said he didn't care if I crashed it or what, just race it. Last laps there, were you worried about Kenny every time he got a chance to close up on you under yellows? On the restarts, he was. Like, I could pull away when the green was out, but I knew Kenny was loose. And if the thing would have kept going green, I could have pulled away, but all the restarts hurt me. There he is, second year in a row. Junior Hanley takes it with a borrowed car. And the owner said, I don't care if you crash or not. That's a great line. George Snyder, amazingly, still finished in the 11th spot, considering he was uh, involved in that final incident with the 14 car. He's followed by John Dillon, Tommy Price, John Kelly, and David Schuler in the 58th car. 16th through 20th, looks like this. Larry Barton, Ron Esau was having a good run, but fell back to 17th. Tim Franklin, Gary Collins, and Scott Lee. Let's once again go down to Paul Page with Kenny Schrader. Well, are you whooped or what? No, it wasn't bad. It was fun. You know, it's only 40 laps. It don't take long to get it done, but... Uh... We just were too loose all day, you know. And don't feel bad running behind them two cats, those are good racers. It looked like the yellows may have been going to help you out there for a while. Well, we were too loose, and we kept heating up our tires and get a little yellow, yellow they'd cool back down, it'd be okay for another couple laps. But uh, we just plain old weren't fast enough. You know, the good thing about it, though, is you come here, 
getting all these events and give the fans just a fine show. I mean, they really appreciated that. Well, I'll tell you what, we just enjoy coming out here and running a lot. Uh, Buddy Job and Dennis Wood, they do a terrific job at this place. We love coming out and running the Winston Cup race. And, but this was the first big race we used to come to every year, and we still like to come back and run it. Well, maybe you can talk them into giving you the win on the Winston Cup race. Well, we got a second and a third here now the last couple races, so we're getting closer. All right, Kenny Schrader, thank you very much. Thank you. Very good, buddy. Okay, man. Quite a show, wouldn't you agree? The midgets were mighty and the stock cars as ferocious as everyone expected them to be. But remember, it doesn't end here. We'll be back with more action from Phoenix next Sunday. We'll show you the virtually unlimited super modified cars and also a bit of rolling American auto racing history, USAC's silver crown machines. For Brock Yates and Paul Page, I'm Steve Evans. Thanks for joining us. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Palish. Supervising producer, John B. Mullen. Produced and directed by Mark Kuchin.